Okay, I'm out. Okay, he's out. He's close to three. Okay, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Gemini was NASA's hastily conceived bridging program designed to perfect I techniques need needed on. for a lunar landing. Gemini 4 saw astronaut Ed White leave his capsule and walk in space, but the spacecraft's attempt to rendezvous with its booster had been a failure. Gemini 5 had set an American endurance record of close to eight days, but its rendezvous exercise had failed as well. On the morning of October the 25th, 1965, two rockets stood awaiting launch at Cape Canaveral. While astronauts Wally Shirar and Tom Stafford prepared for blast-off on Gemini 6, a special Atlas Agena target vehicle stood waiting on Pad 14. Because rendezvous and docking was integral to its moon landing strategy, NASA had commissioned the Agena docking module it would be carried to orbit atop an Atlas booster. As the Gemini 6 crew were being strapped in, the Atlas Agena combination was entering the final minutes of its countdown. The plan was for Gemini 6 to rendezvous and dock with the Agena four times in a flight that was expected to last two days. Gemini 6 was scheduled to launch around 90 minutes after the Agena, with the countdowns being tightly synchronised. The target vehicle lifted off as planned. This was the first Agena flight as part of the Gemini program, but the Atlas booster had served well during the Mercury program, and the Air Force had had success with the Agena upper stage, so no problems were expected. Gemini 6 waited as the target vehicle accelerated after a perfect launch. But minutes later, as the upper stage separated, all telemetry was lost and tracking radar detected five separate pieces. The Gemini mission was now pointless and the launch was cancelled with Shirar and Stafford leaving their spacecraft. There was debate about what to do next. Scheduling for the Gemini program had been tight, with roughly one new launch every six weeks. There was no replacement Agena ready to launch before the next flight, Gemini 7. On the morning of December the 4th, 1965, astronauts Jim Lovell and Frank Borman were breakfasting before the launch of their Gemini 7 spacecraft. Among the others dining with them were the Gemini 6 crew, who would launch nine days later. Gemini 7 was to be the longest duration flight yet, and for comfort during almost 14 days in orbit, the crew were wearing new lightweight spacesuits. NASA's doctors were worried about the effect prolonged exposure to weightlessness would have on astronauts, particularly the observed loss of red blood cells. Gemini 7 was designed to answer medical questions. It launched on schedule before Gemini 6, which had been renamed Gemini 6A. We're on our way, Frank. It had taken NASA more than 60 days to prepare for a new launch. Now crews had eight days till the launch of Gemini 6A and they swung into action immediately. As soon as they reached orbit, the Gemini 7 crew turned their craft and began tracking with its upper stage. Gemini 4 attempted this but it failed due to an insufficient knowledge of orbital mechanics. On December the 12th, Shirar and Stafford again prepared for launch. If all went well, within six hours of blast-off, they would be orbiting alongside Gemini 7. The launch pad crew had done an excellent job readying the booster in record time and the countdown continued smoothly. Two, one. But then shut down. The engines had started and after one second they stopped. 
The commander Shira had the option of pulling the D-ring and ejecting both of them from the capsule, but he sat tight. Nobody knew what had gone wrong. For a second time, the crew of Gemini 6 had failed to launch. A connector had come away before the booster had lifted off, and the onboard computer closed everything down. This was rectified, along with another glitch in a turbo pump. Three days later, they were ready to try again. Go. Five, four, three, two, one. The flight plan called for the rendezvous to happen on Gemini 6's fourth orbit, and Shira made the first orbital correction 94 minutes into the flight. Gemini 7 would remain passive, with all orbital adjustments being made by Gemini 6. After three hours, slightly more than 400 kilometres separated the two craft and Gemini 7 was picked up by Shira and Stafford on radar. After five hours, Gemini 7 appeared as a bright dot, and soon after, the two spacecraft were flying in formation. Three years earlier, in 1962, the Russians had launched Vostoks 3 and 4 so that they could pass close to each other and it had seemed like another Soviet triumph. With the rendezvous of Gemini 6 and 7, the Americans realised that the Vostoks had accomplished two well-timed launches, a very different achievement to the precision on-orbit changes they had accomplished. For more than four hours, the two spacecraft flew side by side, sometimes coming as close as 30 centimetres. It gave NASA confidence in its rendezvous technique, but there had not been a docking as had originally been intended when the target had been the Agena. After slightly more than a day in orbit, Gemini 6 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and was picked up in the Atlantic Ocean. Gemini 7 continued on in orbit for two more record-breaking days, with Borman and Lovell reading books to pass the time. They returned to Earth on December the 18th and were picked up by the Wasp, the same ship that had recovered the Gemini 6 crew. It was at this point that NASA started to believe the American space program was gaining greater expertise than their Soviet adversaries. However, the elusive docking exercise had still not taken place, and nobody realised just how difficult this would be. When the Cassini probe reached Saturn, staff at the JPL Operations Centre watched eagerly for confirmation that it had carried out its orbital insertion instructions. It arrived in July 2004 after a journey lasting almost seven years and it had to perform a precisely aligned 95 minute burn to enter a highly eccentric orbit. Because of the great distances involved, the craft has to perform autonomously Instructions to Cassini are sent a long time in advance via the Deep Space Network. Signals confirming that it had gone into orbit took 85 minutes to reach Earth. After six months orbiting Saturn, Cassini approached Titan, Saturn's biggest moon. By this stage, it had already flown past Titan several times, capturing radar and photographic images. This time, it released a lander, the Huygens probe. Titan
Titan is so large, it holds a thick atmosphere, so Huygens was equipped with a heat shield and a parachute. As it was floating down towards the surface, the lander began taking photographs and analysing the atmosphere's constituent gases. It made the first soft landing in the outer solar system, and although it performed well, relaying data back to Cassini, only one of the orbiter's recorders was on. Half of the images were lost. We now know that Titan has lakes on its surface, lakes of liquid methane. The Cassini probe has been active for more than 10 years, and during that time, it's helped us learn about the strange behaviour of Saturn. At first, it seemed that the northern and southern hemispheres of the gas giant were rotating at different rates, but it now appears that the wind speeds in the south are faster. Cassini's looping orbit is regularly modified, so that it can pass close by features that mission specialists want to study. Another Saturnian moon, Enceladus, surprised observers. It is one-tenth the size of Titan, yet it appears to hold a thin atmosphere of water vapour. Observations suggest this atmosphere is being replenished by cold water volcanoes near the South Pole. Cassini is equipped with a mass spectrometer and it was able to detect salt, water and various hydrocarbons. It is now thought that a salty ocean lies beneath Enceladus's icy crust. Some planetary physicists believe Saturn's inner E-ring receives its particles from Enceladus. In 2008, Cassini was renamed the Equinox mission and recently it received another extension and became the Cassini Solstice mission. It takes Saturn roughly 30 Earth years to orbit the Sun and, like the Earth, its axis is tilted so it has seasons. When Cassini arrived, the planet's North Pole was in shadow and it was only recently that the probe could capture images of the peculiar hexagonal polar vortex. This hexagonal pattern was first observed in the 1980s by the Voyager mission. As spring in Saturn's northern hemisphere progressed, two giant storms were seen developing. They showed us hot spots in the infrared part of the spectrum, with both travelling towards the west. The larger storm moved faster, eventually engulfing the smaller one. Even after disturbances and the cloud patterns had dissipated, the storm still registered in the infrared. The rings orbit over Saturn's equator, extending from 6,000 to 120,000 kilometres above the surface, yet they are only 20 metres thick. They're made of ice, with particle sizes ranging from fine dust to 10 metre chunks. There are clumps within the rings that have changed since the Voyager's visits in the early 80s, with the inner F-ring seeming to vary over a period of weeks. Saturn has at least 150 moons, and moonlets within the rings are thought to disturb the particles. Toward the end of its mission, with fuel running low, the risky trajectory will begin. Cassini will pass between the planet and its innermost ring, where the chance of collision with orbiting debris is extreme. It will sample the upper atmosphere and learn about the mass of the rings. To avoid possible contamination of the fragile moons, Cassini will ultimately be crashed into Saturn. In 2005, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was headed to what were becoming the crowded skies above the Red Planet. Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Express and Mars Odyssey were in orbit around Mars, and the Spirit and Opportunity rovers were on the surface. But the MRO has a lot of different tasks, all paving the way for future Mars missions and culminating in a manned landing on the Red Planet in about 15 years. 
It has been mapping Mars in fine detail and this information has already been used to select a landing site for the Phoenix lander. The orbiter is also collecting detailed information about the weather patterns on Mars. While it continued to transmit a clearer picture of the planet, back on Earth a new rover was taking shape. A rover like none before and one that would work very closely with the MRO. Lockheed Martin, under the supervision of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, was building a rover the size of a small car. Unlike previous rovers, it wouldn't use solar panels for its power. It's equipped with a radioisotope thermoelectric generator with a minimum lifespan of 14 years. Known as Curiosity, the rover has a range of cameras and chemical analysis tools as well as a robotic arm and radiation detector. Before it could fly, Curiosity had to be tested at extreme temperatures and vibration. Towards the end of 2011, Curiosity, fixed into its entry, descent and landing module, was packed into the nose cone of an Atlas V. Because of the proximity of Mars, Six, the launch five, window was extremely four, narrow. Three, two, one, main engine start, zero, and lift off. It would take the craft more than eight months to reach Mars. The Centaur upper stage pushed the craft out of Earth orbit onto a trans-Mars trajectory. Before they separated, the Curiosity package was set rotating for stability. The crew's assembly was equipped with heaters to maintain stable temperatures for critical subsystems that remained dormant during the cruise phase. Solar cells provide power for communication with mission control and thrusters are used for course corrections. Things are looking good. As it approached Mars, the team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory waited. Ten minutes before reaching Mars' atmosphere, the cruise stage was jettisoned and an incredibly complex sequence of events was about to unfold. As it entered the atmosphere, it was travelling at about 20,000 kilometres per hour and the first stage of deceleration began. The thrusters kept the craft aligned to the target, selected with the help of the MRO. Signals confirming each stage of the descent were relayed back to JPL via the Mars Odyssey. Next, balance weights were thrown off so the craft could keep the correct attitude for parachute deployment. Still moving at 1600 kilometers per hour, the small parachute unfurled and the heat shield was discarded. From orbit, the MRO captured this image of the descent stage. At 1500 metres, the descent stage separated from the back shell and the landing thrusters ignited. A radar altimeter monitored both the craft's height speed. At a height of 20 metres and now moving at 3 kilometres per hour, the rover was lowered on cables and the wheels deployed.
When it was on firm ground, it fired pyros, severing the cables. The sky crane technique was used so that dust and debris stirred up by the rockets couldn't damage the rover. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Most of these JPL people have devoted large parts of their lives to this project. This was the first time such a landing had been attempted, and it had been flawless. Almost immediately, an image was relayed back. Using one of its hazard avoidance cameras, Curiosity had sent an image of the surface and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter was playing a vital role as a communications hub. It records signals sent by the rover's UHF transmitter and retransmits them when it can see Earth. Curiosity had been set down near the Gale Crater, just south of the Martian equator. Initially, the rover began transmitting detailed information about its system status and its descent and landing experience. During its first days on Mars, the rover's now redundant flight program was dumped and replaced with surface operations software. Its camera mast was extended and Curiosity began changing completely the way we think about Mars. Gemini 7, are you able to see in the windows of 6 very easily and vice versa? The combined Gemini 6 and 7 missions had flown in formation, but an original objective for two craft to join together in orbit, a process known as docking, could not be attempted because Gemini 6's Agena target vehicle had exploded just after launch. We can uh, very clearly see the right scanners operate. All remaining Gemini missions would include rendezvous and docking, and Gemini 8, with first-time astronauts Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott, would be next. All NASA astronauts must be qualified pilots, and the Space Agency operates its own wing of T-38 jet trainers. To keep their flying hours up, astronauts often fly themselves between facilities across the United States in one of these two-seaters. Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, the astronauts slated to fly Gemini 9, died in poor weather conditions when their T-38 crashed into a building at the McDonnell Aircraft Plant in St. Louis. They were going to inspect their spacecraft. Gemini 9 would become Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan's mission. Each flight had a backup crew that could take over at short notice. NASA was still in a hurry. On March the 16th, 1966, Gemini 8 waited on launch pad 19, while an Agena target vehicle waited on pad 14. The Agena would launch 95 minutes before the Gemini craft, and the two would dock about six hours after launch. But docking was not the only aim of the Gemini 8 mission. Dave Scott was due to make America's second spacewalk. There had been setbacks in the Gemini program and this flight was aimed at catching up. As Armstrong and Scott were being strapped into their craft, the Agena was in the final seconds of its countdown. Mission controller's faith in the Agena had been shaken after the previous vehicle had blown up at the ignition of the second stage. But soon after its launch, there was confirmation that this Agena would be waiting correctly in orbit when Gemini 8 arrived. The Agena was supposed to be controllable from the ground or from the spacecraft, but because there had been difficulty in receiving information from the target craft, 
Mission Control still had doubts about the Agena's attitude control system. Prior to docking, the crew were warned to turn the Agena system off if it gave trouble. The docking manoeuvre went so smoothly that ground crew were at first uncertain that it had really happened. But soon there were problems as the linked craft began spinning and not responding to control. Immediately, Armstrong undocked, but the spin got worse with the astronauts in danger of passing out. They initiated an emergency return to Earth. Later analysis exonerated the Agena, revealing that one of the Gemini craft's thrusters had remained stuck on. The flight had lasted less than 11 hours. The two craft had only stayed docked for 30 minutes and there had been no spacewalk. Yet mission planners noted the calm and professional way that Armstrong had handled what could have been a tragedy. Armstrong and Scott splashed down in the Pacific near Japan, the only Gemini craft not to land in the Atlantic. After the failure of the Atlas Agena target vehicle for the original Gemini 6 mission, its makers were relieved that it had performed well for the Gemini 8 mission. Some said difficulties had been due to the mix of different companies building the thing, with Convair making the Atlas first stage, Lockheed making the upper Agena stage, and McDonnell responsible for the docking adapter. In May 1966, GATV-9 was prepared for launch. It would be Gemini 9's docking target. two minutes went perfectly, but after that, a short caused the right booster engine to gimbal hard over. The rocket flipped and headed back toward the ocean where it crashed. Convair accepted responsibility. As with Gemini 6, this left two astronauts sitting in a fully fueled Titan with nowhere to go. Tom Stafford, who'd been involved in two on-pad aborts with Gemini 6, and now this with Gemini 9, was nicknamed the Mayor of Pad 19. But this time, a standby docking vehicle was available. The upper stage had no propulsion, but it did have a docking collar. It launched two weeks later. Gemini 9, now renamed Gemini 9A, was to follow shortly. But three minutes before the scheduled blast-off, ground computers lost contact with the Gemini computers. With only a 40-second window, the launch was scrubbed. Two days later, they tried again. This would be the sixth time Commander Stafford had been strapped in, with only one mission completed. Stafford and Cernan quickly caught up with their orbiting target but something else had gone wrong. It looks like an angry alligator out here rotating around. The protective shroud had not come away. Inexperienced technicians had taped down the fiberglass lanyards and they kept the two pieces together. Stafford dubbed it the angry alligator. Engineers on the ground desperately sought a solution, but there was just too much risk to the astronauts. There would be no docking on this mission. Next, Cernan left the capsule. 
He was to test a new manoeuvring unit, but his heart rate rose so alarmingly that the doctors ordered him back inside. He was overheating and his helmet had fogged. John Young would command the next mission, Gemini 10. His partner would be Michael Collins making his first flight. He was also due to make the next spacewalk and was training in a cradle floating on air. This was to give him practice using the zip gun, but so far the spacewalks were presenting unexpected difficulties due to overexertion. This looked relaxing. The Gemini flights were starting to conform to a pattern, with an Agena target vehicle launching 100 minutes before the manned spacecraft. This time there were no launch delays. The astronauts had a busy schedule, having to make up for the shortcomings of the two previous flights. The Agena was waiting for them exactly as intended. Rendezvous was now becoming routine. Young and Collins caught up with it and after almost six hours, they had docked. Gemini 10 used an 80-second burst from the Agena's engine to boost them to a higher orbit, where they visited an Agena from the Gemini 8 flight. Their rendezvous and docking exercises had gone well, but activity outside the spacecraft had still been difficult, with the inflated spacesuit limiting movement and important equipment being lost. On the following Gemini 11 flight, Richard Gordon also had great difficulty performing effectively outside the craft. NASA came up with a new training technique, one that they use to this day. Scuba diving had been seen as good training for fitness and regular breathing. Now they'd built a mock-up of the gemini Agena combination in a high school swimming pool in Baltimore. With just 60 days before Gemini 12, Buzz Aldrin began practicing his scheduled routine. In addition to his spacesuit, he carried 28 kilograms of lead to give him a neutral buoyancy. A clip-on tether was designed to solve the problem that previous astronauts had had just staying in one place. Detailed feedback from Aldrin helped engineers position handholds to make extravehicular activity, EVA, more precise. November the 11th, 1966, and the pad crew were all there for the final Gemini mission. Commander James Lovell and his pilot Buzz Aldrin arrived at their rocket with placards on their back saying, The End. Many of the team wishing them farewell had spent years on this project. There had been a suggestion that Gemini 12 should be delayed to coincide with the first launch in the Apollo series, but delays with the new spacecraft and its giant booster made this unfeasible. Rendezvous with the Agena was as expected, but on the ground, an anomaly in telemetry data suggested that the Agena's main engine could give problems, so they cancelled the boost to a higher orbit as had been intended. Lovell docked the two craft. The next day, when Aldrin opened the hatch and moved outside, Everything was different. The handrails made an immense difference. The gradual and deliberate way Aldrin moved gave no problems with exertion or overheating. He easily completed all his tasks, including attaching a tether between the Gemini and the Agena. When the spacecraft undocked, they remained connected. This is a technique NASA wanted to test, but it has not been used since.
Project Gemini had ended on a high note. Jim Lovell had set a new record for the most hours in space, and his pilot, Buzz Aldrin, had more EVA hours than anyone else. The Gemini missions had achieved all they had set out to do. But ahead, there was an even bigger goal, and a much bigger rocket was being developed to make it happen. Nobody realised just how difficult the next stage would be. August the 6th, 2012, and NASA's Curiosity rover is safely on the surface of Mars. Early weeks were devoted to reprogramming the rover and calibrating its suite of instruments. The rover had landed in Gale Crater, a scar left after a meteor impact more than three billion years ago. Gale Crater had been chosen because it shows signs that water had once been present. Curiosity is focused on water and its effect on the early years of the Red Planet, particularly whether it could have supported life. The rover is fitted with a number of specialist cameras. On the central mast are two cameras that provide images in true colour and their sensitivity extends beyond the visual spectrum. One camera has a 15 degree field of view while the other provides a narrower 5 degree view. Both have 8 gigabytes of flash memory. Curiosity has two computers. They coordinate the radio transmissions back to Earth, either directly, via the X-band transmitter, or with UHF, via the Mars orbiters. Relay via the orbiters is preferable, as it gives a higher data rate. Also on the rover's mast are two black and white navigation cameras, designed to deliver a 3D view for ground crew, plotting the path the rover will take. Curiosity's first major destination was Mount Sharp, rising 5,500 metres above the crater floor. But it took around two years to get there, as the terrain is littered with features that the planetary investigators want to examine. The rover is capable of navigating autonomously, but it still relies on instructions from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to set short-range destinations. The images, backed up by chemical analysis, show unequivocally that water was once present at this site. Also housed in Curiosity's mast is a laser that works in conjunction with a suite of instruments known as ChemCam. From as far as 7 metres, it can vaporise a tiny sample and analyse its chemical composition. If a rock bears closer examination, a drill at the end of the rover's robotic arm can extract a sample. The arm also has an X-ray spectrometer and an imager able to capture pictures down to microscopic detail. Powder extracted from the rock is poured into the aperture of the Chem-Min instrument. Using X-rays, the instrument can identify the mineral content of the rock. The first samples that Curiosity tested revealed sulphur, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus and carbon. Yet there have been problems. Just months into its mission, the primary computer went into safe mode. Using the backup computer, it took JPL staff three days to restore the system. And Curiosity's light metal wheels are starting to show signs of damage. 
Some of the rocks are both so jagged and firmly fixed into the Martian soil that the rover drivers are having to think more carefully about the paths they select. The rover has two radiation detectors and information from these suggests that a manned mission to the Red Planet would not be unduly troubled by excessive levels of radiation. The next phase of Curiosity's assignment will see it climb the slopes of Mount Sharp. Mission specialists are excited about the different strata of rock they expect to find. A stream of charged particles emanates from the sun. Known as the solar wind, it flows throughout the solar system. During extreme solar activity, coronal mass ejections bombard the planets. The Earth is largely protected by its magnetic field, but at polar regions, where the magnetic field lines converge, charged particles can spiral down and interact with the upper atmosphere, manifesting as auroras. We know from the Earth's geological record that the poles flip unpredictably from between 100,000 to 50 million years. And over the past 150 years, the Earth's magnetic field has declined in intensity by about 15%. To find out more about our planet's fluctuating magnetic field, the European Space Agency launched a trio of magnetic observation satellites known as SWARM. The three identical satellites measure both the strength and direction of the Earth's magnetic field as it continues to evolve. An hour after launch, they each deployed a magnetometer positioned at the end of a boom to isolate it from any stray fields generated by the satellite's electronics. Called Alpha, Bravo and Charlie, the trio were accurately delivered to north-south orbits at a height of 490 kilometres. The oscillations of the boom would take several minutes to stabilise. Over time, Alpha and Charlie will follow the same path and their orbits will be allowed to decay. Bravo will maintain its launch altitude, but it's gradually drifting to a different orbital plane. This will allow researchers to gain a three-dimensional view of the magnetosphere. Though most of the Earth's magnetic field is generated by movement within the molten iron core, some magnetism is retained in areas of rock and saltwater currents in the oceans also contribute. The swarm satellites will enable researchers to build a dynamic map of the planet's interior. They want to understand why the magnetic field is diminishing and why the Earth's magnetic poles are drifting. 780,000 years ago, the magnetic poles flipped and researchers want to know whether the present fluctuations are symptoms of the approach of another field reversal. A weak area in the magnetosphere above the South Atlantic allows the solar wind to penetrate to lower altitudes. More satellites fail passing above this region than at any other place. The knowledge gained from Swarm has implications beyond sensitive electronics. Continued weakening of the magnetic field will allow more solar radiation to reach the Earth's surface with implications for all living things.